In the 1960s and 70s, a vicious criminal organization terrorized the American South. Based out of Georgia, this group ran illegal liquor, smuggled pills from Mexico, robbed, stole, and murdered their way into infamy. One of the most violent members is thought to have killed over 50 people. There are three murders that he was convicted of that involved an uncommon level of brutality. As recently as February of 2021, other homicides have been officially attributed to this murderous gangster. He would challenge police to catch him in his souped-up cars. He carried out contract killings and was a general menace to the people around him, be they friend, foe, or innocent bystander. Billy Sunday Burke of the Georgia Dixie Mafia. Billy Sunday Burt was born in Barrow County, Georgia on August 12, 1937, as the oldest of eight children to Claude and Eunice Burt. His mother named him after a famous baseball player turned evangelist named William Ashley Sunday, also known as Billy Sunday. His family were sharecroppers, which is essentially someone who works land owned by someone else. The poverty they endured meant that they were often moving from place to place. Billy's dad taught his kids the benefits of honesty and hard work while his mother focused on teaching her kids values from the Bible. The family was so poor and the situation so desperate immediately after the Great Depression that during some times they only had enough for one meal per day. Billy told people that his first crime was to steal a dollar out of his teacher's purse to buy food. Despite his parents' efforts, he would continue to dabble in minor theft throughout his childhood. Billy Burt's dad died in 1946, leaving his wife to try to find a way to make ends meet alone. The family was evicted from the farm that they worked and were forced to live with Eunice's parents. Billy Sunday Burt promised himself that he would escape poverty and get revenge on the landlord who had evicted them. But years later, when he was able to track him down, the man had already passed away. Burt dropped out of school at age 13 so he could get a job and help his mother and her new husband with the bills. His behavior was getting more reckless, however. Once, when he was fired from a job, he doused the woman's car with gasoline, who he believed had gotten him fired. After he ignited her vehicle, Bert stayed to watch her reaction as she came out to her burning car. He would later burn down her home and the car she bought with the insurance money from the first vehicle. After crossing the line from childhood theft to adult crimes, Billy was ready to continue down that road. His primary method of earning money illegally was making and running moonshine. In 1954, at age 17, Billy Sunday Burt married a very young girl. Linda was only 12 when they met and 13 when they married. Billy was starting to build his reputation in the criminal underworld of Georgia. By day, he was working in a stone quarry, and at night, he made moonshine using his grandfather's recipe. Burt claimed he killed for the first time around 1961. He had been making whiskey on the banks of the Appalachie River with his father-in-law, who had a female companion. Two men approached them and struck up a conversation with Bert. He said they made it clear that they were going to assault the woman who was passed out drunk with his father-in-law. When they made a move toward her, Billy pulled a gun from his truck and blasted them. He and his father-in-law buried the men on the riverbank, where they likely remain. Bert hooked up with a moonshine crew led by a man named Hoke Chansey, and then his son Harold. Billy was making more money than he could have imagined as a child. His family was taken care of, and he was expanding the moonshine operation. He also expanded his criminal activities to include running a card game out of a bar he bought and used as a criminal headquarters. Now that he was earning money, Billy's Sunday Burt became even hungrier to expand his criminal enterprise. Bodies began turning up that were attributed to his growing group of outlaws. People would come to Bert if they had a problem that needed solving, and he developed a reputation for handling any dirty work discreetly and effectively. He did not only solve other people's problems, though. In 1972, when he suspected that Harold's cousin Donald was cooperating with law enforcement, he shot him dead, one of three murders that he would be convicted for. After a district attorney named Floyd Hoard was murdered using a car bomb by another bootlegger on August 7, 1967, the criminal underworld of Georgia was shaken to its core by the police. Hoard had been a district attorney in Jackson County and had been investigating a bootlegger named Cliff Park. 
there had been a recent bust of one of his stills and Park wanted revenge. The murder drew the focus of law enforcement and received national attention. In the aftermath, the other gang leaders got together and agreed to form a loose alliance. They also agreed against any future attacks on government officials unless every one of them were consulted and gave their consent. The collection of gangs became known as the Georgia Dixie Mafia, and Billy Sunday Burt worked for them all. Burt still took care of his own business with the same ruthlessness as his criminal affairs. After he totaled his car in an accident, Burt's insurance agent refused to pay out for his policy. Tom Locke, the insurance agent, would be found dead in his office with three gunshot wounds. This was after Burt blew up his previous office with dynamite. However, the death was ruled a suicide. Billy told his son when Locke refused to pay out on the policy, he did commit suicide, just not directly. There are countless bank robberies, drug runs, and batches of moonshine that built up a criminal empire led by Burt, but his most notorious acts were murders. While alive, he was only convicted of three murders, but in 2021, law enforcement linked him to three additional murders. The case was solved with the help of Billy's son and one of the accomplices. This murder occurred in 1972. Billy's son, Shane Burt, told authorities that his father had told him the story of a crime he committed during a snowstorm in the North Carolina mountains. In February of 1972, three people lost their lives to Billy and his gang. Burt, Billy Wayne Davis, Bobby Jean Gaddis, and Charles Reed arrived at the home to perform a murder-for-hire job on that fateful stormy night. The three occupants of the house were 51-year-old Bruce Durham, his wife, 44-year-old Virginia, and their 18-year-old son, Bobby. Their son-in-law came to check on them on February 3, 1972, when he and his wife got a strange phone call from Virginia. Her voice was muffled and she said they were being attacked. He found the three bodies strangled and shoved into a bathtub filled with water, possibly to eliminate evidence. They had been strangled with a power cord and Bruce was found to have been alive when his head was submerged in water, resulting in his drowning. The house had been ransacked, yet a bank bag with cash was left behind. These murders went unsolved for nearly 50 years until the Watauga Sheriff Department got the tip from Billy's son, Shane, about what his father had told him from behind bars. They were able to confirm the story by interviewing Billy Wayne Davis between 2019 and 2021. However, they were not able to find out who had arranged the murders. The other killings that Billy was convicted of occurred on December 22, 1973. Burt committed a horrific double murder along with two other gangsters. They had received a tip that an elderly couple had a large amount of cash at their home. 75-year-old Reed Oliver Fleming and his 73-year-old wife Lois owned a used car lot in Rennes, Georgia. Bert had gotten word from a friend about the elderly couple and that they had $50,000 stashed away. He rounded up two others to assist in the crime, Bobby Jean Gaddis and Charles Reed. Billy Burt had tried once before on December 19, 1973 with a different pair of henchmen, but was scared off by an unknown vehicle parked in front of the Fleming's home. However, two days later, on December 22, 1973, the three men returned and found the couple home alone. That night, Burt, Gaddis, and Reed knocked on the front door with a story about wanting to buy a truck that one had looked at earlier in the day at the lot. They then forced their way in and tied up the man and wife. Burt and Reed drove the car that they had used down the road, then returned in the Fleming's car to torture the couple into telling them where the money was. What the killers would later tell their friend about what happened is horrific. Using wire coat hangers, they slowly strangled Reed and Lois while demanding to know where their money was. No mercy was shown to either victim, as later autopsies would show. Each had marks and damage to their necks, indicating multiple applications of ligature strangulation. Reed was battered from where he had thrashed and bashed his head into the ground, and his left thumbnail was split down the middle. His wife had been treated similarly, and both were found with the coat hangers still wrapped around their throats. The vicious three laughed about how though Lois was deaf, she heard them a lot better once they started to strangle her. Despite their ransacking the house, the torture, and murders, Bert and his crew did not find the $50,000 they had been promised. Instead, they found a large stash of coins buried in the Fleming's fruit cellar. The couple went to church every Sunday, and the next day, when they did not show up, their son came to see if something was wrong. The house was in shambles from the three monsters rifling through it. He found his parents dead and laid out on their bed. Lois had a wire coat hanger wrapped around her throat, while her husband had a hanger and the cables of an alarm clock and a drill tightened around his neck. 
both had been bound using their own bed sheets. A coroner determined that the Flemings died between 10 and 11 p.m. the night before. Shortly after the Fleming murders, things began to unravel for Billy Sunday Burt's branch of the Georgia Dixie Mafia. One of his accomplices got arrested for bank robbery after his wife deposited money from a recent heist. Billy Wayne Davis's wife did not follow the arrangement they had set up of waiting to use any money from their robberies to avoid tracked serial numbers being reported. This arrest led to the discovery of the network that Davis was involved in through the monitored jail phone calls. When confronted and told his wife had been arrested as well, Davis broke down and spilled the beans on Billy Sunday Burt. On April 3, 1974, Billy was arrested outside his home. While he was initially only arrested for the bank robbery charge, his criminal history was being picked through with a fine-tooth comb. He was soon being looked at for the Fleming murders, and the police were soon finding strings to pull that unraveled the events of that night. His accomplice Gaddis was identified by a customer who had been at the Fleming car lot when he had come to look at the truck earlier in the day of the murder. Bert and Gaddis were also identified by two men who had stopped to help them when their car broke down in the early morning hours after the killings. What sealed Bert's fate was the testimony of Billy Wayne Davis. He told the police what the killers had said to him on that night and how they described the murders. Billy Sunday Burt was found guilty and sentenced to death. It should be noted that he vehemently denied any involvement in the Fleming murders, even going so far as to confess to other crimes as an alibi. His son, Billy Stonewall Burt, carries this torch and even threatens anyone who mentions the grisly crime and his father on Facebook. Because of Davis's betrayal, Burt's sense of loyalty to the criminal code was shattered. Almost immediately after sentencing, he reported his own involvement in the murder of two doctors that Davis helped with. Seven men had been convicted of the shooting death of doctors Warren and Rosina Matthews. They were subsequently exonerated after the witness admitted to being drugged and fed information about the case as well as Burt's confession. Davis would also be implicated in the murder of Max Sibley, who they had robbed of several thousand dollars. This information led to Davis receiving a life sentence for his part in these crimes. Perhaps a fear of Burt's retribution led to Davis holding back information about the Durham murders until after his former partner's death. In 1977, Burt and Gaddis's death sentences were overturned. Burt would remain in prison for more than 40 years until his death in 2017 at Ware State Prison after a battle with Parkinson's. There are so many more details to Billy Sunday Burt's criminal career that we will never know but he was without a doubt a vicious and murderous gangster.